So a little bit about myself, not so much in terms of the story, but just in terms of why this theme is so important to me personally. Ever since I remember myself, and some of you may know that my uh, interest in arts early on led me to pursue the career of an artist. And I was studying art from as early as age of 12. I was given to a studio of a local painter in Tashkent city where I was born, capital of Uzbekistan back then, was still part of the Greater Soviet Union. And I began my kind of uh, uh, years of uh, real, real kind of diving, delving into the acquiring all the skills of what would later develop into fully fledged career of an artist living in London in the 90s. But one thing what uh, was always uh, fascinating for, for me is the place of human body in art. Always. My, my mother even kept this portfolio of drawings, which I did as a little kid, and periodically I would throw away things, so she would just hide it away from me, so as to save some of these early steps. And she showed it to me when I was already, uh, we could say, professional artist. She just wanted to show me the early, you know, years of unfoldment. And there were these drawings, including one particular drawing where this kind of primitively obviously drawn by a 10-year-old, I presume, uh, conglomerate of bodies in a kind of wrestling-like, in a kind of uh, uh, different positions and forms, all of them naked, by the way, all of them naked. And when my mother asked me, what is it that you're drawing here, right? And apparently I gave her a response that these are gods fighting with humans. These are like, you know, obviously I must have already by then was delving into the Greek mythology and everything Greek was very important in my personal evolution. Very important in my upbringing. I was a lover and an avid reader of uh, not just Greek myths, but soon later the philosophers, Kinnicks, you know, Socrates, you name them. So the place of a human in that particular un unfoldment, human and the body, was central. And it became central in my art to the degree that when I was out of the all the studies, colleges, and the academy, which, by the way, I transited through St. Petersburg and the Academy of Fine Arts, only to find myself eventually settling down in London. And my first experiments in art, when I decided that now is the time to kind of settle on something where I can begin to develop my own language. We're talking about very early 90s, as early as 1991 with the arrival to London, with all this exposure to the overwhelmingly rich artistic landscape, with the domination above all else by the uh, conceptual scene uh, in the art world at the time. All that, what would be later known as a Brit Park, you know, the Charles Saatchi as the patron of Damien Hirst and all the rest of it. All these are my contemporaries, you know, these are the people who have become known names in the art world at the time, in the early 90s, throughout the 90s, were all my contemporaries. And of course, it was very important to me because I was very ambitious. I felt I have a mission, I have something to say. To me, it was very important to have a, some kind of... Um, certain artistic, let's say, and at the very same time, fully 
rooted in my belief system work that I would produce. And in no time I found myself the need to go back and strip bare everything to that essential of human figure on a single canvas. And if any of you have seen these uh, experiments in art, I call them experiments, of course, they, they are painted with the great understanding and knowledge and also skills of that what falls under the category of Western European art. Maybe more inkling towards that uh, cradle of Western European civilization with Greece and all things Mediterranean. Right? So, of course, it was a human figure, more often male figure than female figure. And I cannot explain you the reasons, although there were a lot of um, talks behind the scenes. You know, some people may have thought that this may be some kind of inadvertently an act of unconsciously expressing certain uh, frustrations, because this was also at the time when the psychology was thrown into the mix in the art, art circles. So what all this had got to do with the topic of uh, spiritual enterprise and what have you? Soon it will become clearer. What I'm trying to say is that the place and role of a human body has been for me central ever since I remember myself. It was very important. Important from every point of view, important from every perspective. Of course, um, soon as I began my uh, studies of philosophy, which was uh, in parallel with my interest in art, uh, culminating with um, German uh, existentialists and leading all the way to Martin Heidegger, where also my interest in all things Western come to an end, or rather come to a halt. I remember very well when I was reading uh, later Heidegger's uh, journals and diaries, post being and time, his seminal work, I caught myself in thinking that all this, what I'm doing now, is reading a brilliant man's expositions on trying to locate his way back to being in terms of where the Western philosophy went. And he refers out of, partially out of admiration, partially out of almost dismay, if not frustration, that this is not his direct experience and knowledge, but a kind of a mental way of how he can crack this code. And with the examples given of that references towards his favorite poet, exemplified in the figure of Friedrich Holderlin, another very well known in German speaking language, uh, romantic poet of the late 19th century. So when I read some of the poems by Friedrich Horderlin, although there were translations obviously by then into English, I've realized immediately that this man speaks from direct experience of being rather than from inferences into that whole, whole history of Western European ideas and ideations about being. And at some point, of course, there was this departure. Philosophy became a thing in its own right, a discipline in its own right. And what Martin Heidegger was trying to do, he was trying to infuse philosophy with a new vitality by pointing out that the main core question of all philosophy has always been its attitude in relation to being and nothing else. For that, he has to go all the way back to pre-Socratics through his kind of uh, interest in Nietzsche. And this is where that return begin to take place in myself. Revisiting all my interests 
tracing all the way back myself to my teenage years, I have found myself that I no longer want to read about it. I want to know being firsthand. I want to see the face of God to use the language of Rumi. And so I closed Martin Heidegger's books, never to return to them again. And I dive fully into the Indian philosophy. Or I should say all things, all things Vedic. I was fortunate enough because through the grace of my mother's kind of guidance, there was this book passed uh, to me in Russian by one of the more known disciples of Shriya Rabinda. It's a French man uh, under spiritual name Satprem. And the book of Satprem introduced me to the Shriya Rabinda's thoughts, Shriya Rabinda's way of thinking. So, of course, uh, soon after I began reading the Bhagavad Gita, I was initiated into meditation in a dream. I was going through some psychological uh, transformation and a lot of personal trauma at the time, not knowing where I'm going to be, where I'm going to live, still feel pretty much out of my own uh, place in London, and this was already by then, mid-90s. And so from there on, it just took me and absorbed me to that stream. So this uh, it ushered a whole phase, a prolonged phase, which I refer to in that class, classically spoken term, years of sadhana. Uh, upon being initiated in a dream spontaneously, uh, I took transcendental meditation course, I became a meditator, and after five years of meditating, I took another, this time advanced course, known as TMCD course, and then it's when it all happened. It's just basically a radical transformation of consciousness, in my mid-thirties, uh, I undergone this process, which in turn took another five years of fully embodying this profound breakthrough into what initially felt like the end of everything I knew, the end of myself as I knew myself, the end of known. This was not a lightly, I mean, these are not lightly speaking words, I can speak them lightly now, I can even smile, I can joke about it, but back in the days it was far, far from it. Back in the days it was a real, real deal. There were months, if not years, of having no idea of how I'm going to make ends meet, how my life is going to pan out, what is going to be happening here, but I knew very well that I'm not this person walking the earth. I knew that I'm this and of course open the space and you can fill it in at your own will whatever you wish to place there because anything that can be said about it will always fall short of the actual experience which was nothing other than just simply a state of being. Of course it took a while before that has become a normal, uh, ordinary even, very natural way of being. And upon, again, uh, being met with several necessary challenges, exemplified in balancing this with quite a dramatic throw of myself into the life of a householder. It's like literally I came out of the another five years of sadhana, now intense sadhana to stabilize and to integrate all this, only to become a family man overnight and having a very lucrative job 
a tremendous responsibility, flying, like being a high flyer, you know, this, um, one day I'm here, next day I'm there, one day I'm in London, next day I'm in Asia, next day I'm in Moscow, next day I'm in Paris. And, you know, the birth of first child, you know, you name it. So, in other words, what I'm trying to say here in uh, going into this uh, background story is that there has been a lot of quite, I would say, uh, dramatic extremes between a complete and utter solitude and uh, that utterly sattvic lifestyle where meditation, or rather my day, would be comprised of uh, easily five hours of meditation and that would be just just like a leisurely, leisurely uh, in diving into that, then I would meditate more at night than, you know, only to suddenly being uh, amidst of what the life would throw at me with all its demands. And at some point I realized that I want to step out and begin to share that, which was already inevitably taking place. I was already inadvertently holding meetings, gatherings, uh, at first impromptu, uh, at first to the community of meditators uh, with whom I was treading the path those years, and thereafter consciously making that decision to go public. So this is why I would like to uh, maybe make this first reference to the actual theme of what we set to discuss today. So, this is not so much um, an attempt to uh, orient or position you in terms of the scholarly understanding. It's more of a poetic attempt in the face of the enormity of the undertaking. So I will allow myself these slight juxtapositions versus arabesque style of pacing things together, all given at your discretion and all given to your own imagination, will and ability to string it together in how you wish to do that. One way or another, I find myself with that decision to go out to teach publicly this time around. This happened approximately about 10 years ago. Uh, around 2010 to 2012, I was already f fully, fully looking out into the venues and avenues to be uh, reckoned as a fully-fledged guide. And of course, me coming out of these years of studies, sadhana, personal practice, right, and I had to get acquainted with what was happening out there, with what was happening in the, in the you know, what was the, the main talk of town, so to speak. And to my amazement, I found that there is this uh, non-duality. There's this uh, non-duality has been since the 90s, but it somehow did not touch very much. They did not, uh, I did not get at all encountered that when I was painting away as an artist in the 90s in London. So this was kind of with the delay of, I would say, almost 10 years. I'm catching up quickly on all the names, on all the main figures, on all the main players of movers and shakers. Of course, I've heard about Eckhart Tolle and all the rest of it. I'm not talking about that. I've heard about the Deepak Chopras of today and yesterday. But all these new names that uh, appeared on the scene, except perhaps uh, that of Adyashanti, I still remember to this day when I was walking the street of London, somewhere to, walked into the Watkins, that very well-known shop in the, oh, just off the Bloomsbury, I mean, Shaftesbury Avenue. And as I um, looked into the shop window to see the latest publications, I saw this small book, The Impact of Awakening, with the young face of Adi on the cover, 
And I was like, oh, this is like, this man is awakened. There's absolutely no kidding. You know, this is not just an author. There's like, I could just see and recognize instantly. This, we're talking about, let me, let me just try to guess. It was about 2000 or 2001, maximum 2002. Correct me if I'm wrong, but this is when uh, that book was launched, at least in London. So this is it. Then for many years, I haven't heard anything. I haven't seen anything. I haven't read. Obviously, I haven't had no need to read that book. I was just very pleased to hear and see that this is happening. There's a contemporary man out there comes out directly, freshly out of this uh, first-hand realizations. It's not a scholarly account, nor is it an, an attempt to, you know, give you an intellectual insight. It's a real deal. Anyway, now, I'm in Costa Rica. The whole family, we're already deep in the jungles of Costa Rica, and I'm getting in touch with some people out there. And soon after, I had this one interview, another interview. Uh, the first interview I gave was to Rick Archer for the Buddha, the gas pump. And Rick, in the wake of that interview, invited me to come to Science and Non-Duality Conference the same year, in 2012, and be on a panel with John Hagelin and another TMA, uh, lesser known from Vancouver, Mark McCoy. So this was my first introduction and kind of like first uh, arrival at the uh, what would be called at the time, the really where all that was happening, science and duality, after all, uh, you know, based on the name itself, this is where all the movers and shakers would get together. And of course, by then, or prior to that event, I had the chance to watch presentations and videos, uh, some of the key uh, people in the scene. And what struck me there and then is utter and entire dismissal of the importance of the body. It was literally, the whole scene was dominated by uh, what we could even speak today in retrospect as there is no body. In fact, the, there is nobody was even spoken by many teachers at the time at the science and non-duality, at that very science and non-duality that I have attended back in 2012, as well as in many other corners of spiritual, whatever spiritual conversations will take place under that clock of non-duality. It was very puzzling for me. For many reasons, of course. Uh, one of the reasons, of course, was that I was coming from a very rich tradition where body was understood to be much more than just a human body, what we consider it to be in a given culture. Both, by the way, in a given culture, in terms of its currently shared collective consensus, dominated by the... I would say, scientific um, perspective on what the body represents today, as well as how the body is, uh, was viewed, still viewed in many circles in terms of spiritual side of it all. So, of course, for me this felt as a very important uh, vacuum that needed to be filled, a void, whatever you may call it. So I zoomed there, there and then. And not surprisingly, people circ circled me, surrounded me at that very first time in California, that it was in San Rafael, I remember to these days, whether I'm outside or whether inside after presentation, you know, people will just gather and, you know, just these talks and questions and 
you know, you are like, oh, you're talking about the body. Wait, hang, hang on a second. You also mentioned the term the heart, you know, and this, there were people still alive back then who uh, were with all the generation of teachers, teachers of the 70s, the homegrown in the United States realizes, so to speak, you know, people of the generation of the Alan Watts, of the Adidas Samraj, of Ram Das, uh, the followers of Swami Muktananda, the Siddha Yoga, and of course, the TMS. All this was very interesting mix, because somehow it felt that, forgive me for that kind of uh, audacity to speak uh, about myself in such manner, but it felt as if I have a touched a very important nerve and I brought something again which felt relevant. Not surprisingly, of course, this was definitely the time of re-evaluation. And I could see as within the next few years, the conversation, even at the science and non-duality, begin to change. When I came to science and non-duality, the only real conversations under that umbrella of Tantra were held by uh, Sally Kempton, whom I've met and I was on a panel together, by the way, on the Kashmir Shaivism, a few years after. Some of you may be familiar with that panel, uh, together with Menas Kafatas as well, the brilliant quantum physicist, both of whom were uh, disciples of Swami Muktananda, whom I've mentioned just now. But the scene was still dom dominated by uh, there is no body. It's all an illusion, there is no body. Body is not there. You are not there. It's only consciousness. It's only awareness. You know, this body is an epiphenomenon. You don't exist. And of course, I'm maybe dumbing it down slightly, but the conversation even of the most sophisticated teachers was not far from resting on this exegesis. And this was somehow begin to seep in on the background of a growing epidemic of those who would go through awakening and would not be able to receive any guidance along the way. So I soon found myself simultaneously here, on one hand, on a role of bringing something which obviously is a long forgotten truth. On the, on the other hand, feeling another gap, that of what spiritual emergency is all about. Even at the Science and Non-Duality, I would be approached by many, many people some of whom were already presenting at these very conferences, but in the more private affairs, in the more private gatherings and encounters, these people will come helpless in terms of their predicament because, you know, from not being able to sleep for years to not being able to digest food to the Korean heap of other um, chronic conditions, all or in the wake of, guess what, awakening, you see? So in other words, this became very clear to me, that the situation is really dramatic. The situation is, in fact, is that although non-duality had a very noble and novel idea, right from get, get going, in fact, could also be held accountable as an entire movement for creating a possibility of a tremendous bypassing when it comes to the importance and the role of neurophysiology in this whole process we speak of as awakening. So this is a personal background, a personal story, and I want to read something now. When I was to compose, uh, when I was to write one of my essays, this was a second essay specifically written for my presentation, now already second and third presentation at the Science and Non-Duality, back in 2013, I wrote this article, which was in the form of an essay entitled The Vibrant 
self. And I've added a short verse like semi-poetic um, muttering from some of my earlier diaries, which sounds as follows. When silence speaks, it tells the story of creation. While some stories are more profound, the story of a human body embodies all other stories in its heart. And there it goes. Uh, this essay was meant to break the ice. And although the main idea was to give that first taste of, uh, well, not the first taste, but the Kashmir Shaivism was pretty much uh, undiscovered and the territory of very few scholars and some enthusiasts. We're talking about 10 years ago. None of the teachers today, teachers who are very well known, had Kashmir Shaivism on their CVs. It happened later. I was finding it to my amaz amazement how suddenly it became in vogue philosophy. Suddenly everyone wants to feel some kind of association to it, including those teachers who not long ago were uh, propounding their and dressing their teachings in what, in my understanding, more or less uh, diluted classical Advaita Vedanta, and there is a term for it in the in a scholarly language known as Neo Advaita. I want to read you something else now. It's a short excerpt from that essay with the from the chapter The Body of Light. I think it will also serve us beautifully as that still prologue, still building a bridge to the theme. Speaking from the perspective of the evolution of our Mother Earth, human consciousness is not just a stage, but also a culminating process on this beautiful planet. Here, consciousness is enlivened to its utmost, so it can reflect the light of its own awareness in this very body. So human life is not yet another accident or a phase, but the manifestation of a process inseparable from the overall evolution of the Earth. Here, consciousness went through a series of contracting and expanding frequencies in dizzying degree of speed and through space-bending vortexes of time, crystallizing its vibrant mathematical proportions through sacred structural geometry as minerals, converting sunlight into oxygen in an act of a gigantic respiration as the mighty kingdom of plants, playing and procreating its instinctual desire through an infinite variety of forms and movements as animals, and embracing it all by reaching to the stars and reconcile all polarities as being in its human form. Vibrant Self, Mallorca, 2013. So, this um, was the, I would say, my contribution to the very necessary changes in the overall spiritual scene. And I can tell you, I can attest you that not sooner than 2000, I would say 14, 15, the whole scene begin to change. Suddenly, Tantra is on everyone's lips. Suddenly, Shakti, everyone wants to say that term. Suddenly, everyone feeling, feeling Tantric in their bones. And of course, this was great, because if we speak Tantra, if we say Shakti, we cannot deny the body. We cannot say there's nobody home, because somebody is really home, because the body and home here is inseparable, because if there is nobody home, then this whole enterprise of spiritual realization is but a bluff, and we know it is not. Hence, the long process of rehabilitation 
began from there and then. Of course, I was destined to, um, I, I, wasn't, I, I wasn't destined to carry on my work at uh, Science and Non-Duality. It wasn't all that nice and dandy, but this is not about, uh, it's, this presentation is not so much about the convoluting kind of perspectives and the clash of egos and personalities and what have you. I did my job, I'm happy about that. So when the time was for me no longer to take be part of this uh, still fantastic, amazing events, I found myself to be much busier and also uh, working uh, in places where that work was really, really needed. And uh, the whole work, the whole emphasis was shifted towards this life containers where we offer this work we call immersions. So now, uh, with like done with that personal story, right, with that, uh, which I felt kind of gives you um, a more retrospective perspective, and I'm sure some of you can relate to that, maybe most of you can relate to that in terms of understanding whether you agree or not it's another story but that is the retrospective perspective if you look at it now and what i feel personally really really uh, happy about and if not satisfied then when i hear this or that non-dual teacher who back then was denying and kind of uh, uh, contributing to that bypassing or error of bypassing they're much more willing to speak about the importance of the somatics. They're much more willing to delve into the importance of the emotional intelligence, which is intimately interconnected in the way we are wired in this body, in the way we process all information in this body. So we're kind of coming of age, I would say, in terms of what and how we have been and what have happened. Not that the dilemma of what the body is, its role in place, is being solved. Far from it. In fact, this is where I feel the importance of this theme uh, brings so much uh, excitement at once with the sense of that almost uh, um, unsurmountable level of responsibility is how do we going to really reposition ourselves because we do not have any ground to truly stand on in terms of understanding, in terms of shared understanding. Why? Because it's two different worlds. The world of spiritual unfoldment and the world of spiritual enterprise and the world of scientific breakthroughs and scientific understanding are very, very marginally overlapped. We rejoice when we hear what's happening today in the field of neuroscience, just as we've rejoiced in the past century what was happening in the field of quantum physics because it kind of felt as if the time has come when centuries of separation, when art, science and spirituality can join together is coming to an end. But that doesn't seem to be the... Uh, it comes and goes. It's like this tango. It's come, it seems almost as if uh, it's become a visceral possibility, only to drift away and all this being denied. And again and again, there is still a lot of fragmentation within spiritual circles in terms of the understanding on the body. So therefore, I'd like to now make a leap towards this concept of the body in India, concept of the body in Western culture, again, to give us uh, a greater, uh, well, a greater grasp of this whole thing. So the concept of the body in India in itself has this interesting uh, view, which runs alongside each other, these two parallel views, two parallel perspectives. You know, that which is linked to the classical Advaita Vedanta uh, with its main 
exponent in Adi Shankara, who, scholarly speaking, have crystallized, summarized, and brought down everything in a fully compacted way, even if we to go by the great sayings, the so-called Mahavakyas, that Adi Shankara did not invent it. He simply elaborated them and give, gave them a new to his generation of people of India, which is 8th century of the common era. You know, Aham Brahmasmi, Tatvamasi, you know, all this, thou art that, I am totality, you know, I am this, this is that. So all these great sayings attributed to Adi Shankara serve as cornstones of everything we know about Advaita Vedanta all the way to the Ramana Maharshi, let's say, and into the fully-fledged scene of the new Advaita or the non-duality. And in that perspective, we will now have to really, really be attentive and tread slowly. Such practices known as neti neti, which simply means not this, not this, is a practice just as any other practice which meant to uh, create a systematic way of disentangling a sense of identity, of consciousness, from the conglomerate of how, let's say, soul, which is nothing other than totality of awareness, is dressed in. So this dressing, this layers, this is how the soul, Atma, is dressed, is true to that line of thought in Advaita Vedanta and true to another parallel line of thought which is associated with Tantric perspective, which in turn is also uh, said to be the earlier Upanishadic teachings, where the emphasis is not so much on so-called spitting it out, but by gobbling it down. It's a slang term, of course, to simplify the perspectives, the respective perspectives adopted by the camps of the Advaita Vedantists to that of the Tantrikas. In the Advaita Vedanta, the path of the recluse, right? It's a perfect path of the recluse, as expounded by Adi Shankara. Adi Shankara was a sannyasi. He was a maha sannyasi, and Adi Shankara has began that order of sannyasis. The order of Shankara is one of the most coveted orders of sannyasins known today in India. So if you are initiated into the uh, sannyas of Shankara, you see, this is considered to be the highest uh, honored way of that, what is known as a reclusive way of life. And if any of you are familiar a little bit with what sannyasin means, it's a very, very serious stuff. Sannyasin is not an armchair philosopher, non-dualist, neo advaitin who feels comfortably uh, joyous to delve into non-duality teachings after a good meal, maybe a glass of wine, and some good uh, prospect for an evening in front of the Netflix. But it's a complete and utter walking out of this life. Walking out of this life to the degree where his own mother culturally has no right to take him back if the decision is made. 